I'll probably give it about one more minute as people continue to join. So stay tuned. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a couple of minutes after the hour here. I think we have a quorum to get started. So thank you everyone very much for joining our Monday seminar series here. We're very pleased to, uh, to have uh, Jeanette Green with us here from Space Hazards Applications. I'm gonna give the introduction and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded. Uh, and as we, as we go through, you can type your questions in the chat and we'll be able to ask them to Janet afterward. So yeah, thank you for joining us again, Janet Green. Janet specializes in understanding the damaging effects of space weather on satellites. And she received her PhD in geophysics and space physics from UCLA, where she studied the physical mechanisms that cause large intensifications and depletions of the radiation environment around Earth that threaten the global satellite fleet. And at NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center and the National Centers for Environmental Information, she led satellite anomaly investigations, monitored the radiation data from the NOAA satellite constellation, and developed products and tools for assessing the real-time radiation hazards. And she now continues this work on the radiation environment and its hazards as a founding owner of Space Hazards Applications. So with that, thank you very much, Janet. Feel free to take it away. Okay, well, thank you. And Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm Janet Green, and as you heard, I'm the founder of Space Hazards Applications. It's a small company, and we're focused on doing research and developing tools for understanding how space weather impacts satellites. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And I've got the chat box up, so if you have questions, I can try and address them. Um, but we might have to wait till the end if I don't see it. Okay, so I'm going to start by describing some of the issues that space weather can cause for satellites and why that's such a concern, particularly now with all the changes that are going on in the satellite industry. Um, then I'll give a brief tutorial overview of the radiation environment that impacts satellites, describe some of the physics, that controls that environment, how we model it, and what kind of applications are available now for monitoring that risk to satellites. So parts of this might be very basic for some of you that are more experienced, um, but hopefully helpful for those of you that are just getting interested in space weather. So we've known since the launch of the Explorer 1 satellite, that's the first US satellite that the Earth is surrounded by intense particle radiation that can sometimes cause satellites and instruments to behave in very unexpected ways. So Explorer 1 carried a simple Geiger counter, and it was maybe the first example of an anomaly caused by space radiation. So the instrument completely saturated, and you can see the data plot up here in the top right corner. And the counts actually went down to zero because of dead time issues caused by the surprisingly intense and unexpected radiation. So basically the instrument just couldn't count the incoming particles fast enough. Since then, we've launched a few more satellites and we've learned quite a bit more about how space radiation can impact satellites. We know that the radiation can cause these four types of anomalies that I've listed here. So surface charging, that's caused by the low to medium energy particles. They can collect on the exterior of a satellite and charge it up to high potentials. And that in and of itself is not really an issue. 
but if you have different surface materials on the satellite, it can cause differential voltages and eventually lead to an electrostatic discharge that can damage your solar arrays or it can make an electromagnetic pulse that couples into the satellite electronics and then puts your satellite into some unexpected state. Internal charging is very similar, only that's caused by the really high energy electrons. So these have enough energy that they can go straight straight through external shielding, and then they can build up in dielectric materials like circuit boards or cable insulators, or sometimes on ungrounded uh, metal like spot shields or connector contacts. And again, the charge will build until reaching a breakdown threshold, and then you can get an electrostatic discharge. But now, since it's inside your satellite, that can damage sensitive electronic components. And then single event upsets, that's caused by the really high energy protons that are so energetic, they can just pass straight through the satellite. Um, and if they happen to go through uh, an electronic device, it'll leave an ionizing track that can uh, cause a catastrophic failure or uh, flip a bit and cause some uncommanded mode or state change that then you have to address on the ground. And then total dose effects, that's just the slow degradation of all the electronic components and um, solar arrays due to this constant bombardment by the high energy particles. So it's now been 60 years after discovering that space is radioactive, but we still don't have a comprehensive set of tools to predict and monitor those impacts. And that's because the nearer space radiation environment is complicated and I'm talking about it like it's a constant background, but each one of these impacts is caused by uh, different particle populations. The particles come from different sources and the intensities really are not constant at all. Uh, the different particle flux levels can increase and decrease by orders of magnitude on very short timescales of hours. And they're all controlled by slightly different physics and this system that extends from the sun all the way down to the upper atmosphere. So even though it's been 60 years, we're still learning about how this system works and how best to cope with it. So we know there are there these four different types of anomalies. It's also helpful to know which causes the most problems for satellites so we can focus our attention there. So based on one of the more comprehensive studies, electrostatic discharges predominantly from internal charging cause the most problems. These are most likely to occur uh, on satellites in geosynchronous orbit. And that's a big deal because a typical communication satellite can cost something like $250 million. And two examples of issues possibly caused by electrostatic discharges are the complete loss of Intelsat 29E just a few years ago, and also the loss of control of the Galaxy 15 satellite that drifted through geosynchronous orbit uh, for eight months. But the trouble here is that anomalies aren't formally tracked. So there's no requirement to report when these things happen. So there is no comprehensive database of these events to analyze. And I think I said this was a recent study, but it's from 1999, so over 20 years ago. And a whole lot has changed since then. And a lot has changed really just in the past few years even. And as I'm sure most of you are probably aware, if you read the news or looked up in the sky lately, uh, the number of satellites in orbit is rapidly increasing. So maybe you've even seen some of the trails of the Starlink satellites after they've been launched. We just saw that from our backyard a few months ago. Space is completely different than it was 20 years ago when that study was done. And it used to be that most of the satellites were in geosynchronous orbit, but that now that's completely switched. 
and there are many more now in the Earth orbit. And I think I pulled these numbers a few months ago, so I'm sure even today there's more. And we're talking about plans now for 50,000 plus satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, now, most of these satellites are small cubes, CubeSats, and they're not the large $250 million satellites like in Geosynchronous, but just the sheer numbers of satellites that we're dealing with now has created new challenges for operations and space weather is a part of that challenge. So space traffic management now is a real concern. And this uh, plot on the top here uh, highlights this issue and it's showing the number of objects at each altitude with some of the current and planned constellations. So you can see things like the NOAA satellites and Iridium. And then the shaded regions are showing the space debris where orange is what's tracked space debris. And then the blue is just the potentially lethal but too small to be tracked debris. So you can see that space is becoming increasingly crowded and it's becoming more difficult already to avoid collisions. And we're only at several thousand satellites with 48,000 more to go. And you can see the problem escalating in this bottom plot which is showing the increasing number of conjunction data messages that are sent each month. So these are messages that are sent to warn operators of possible collisions. And most of the thousands of messages don't really uh, amount to much, uh, but there are now 27 so-called emergency messages uh, that are sent each day. So, Space weather um, and impacts from particle radiation are, I think, a sometimes overlooked aspect of this space traffic management problem, because we know from experience that an issue for one satellite can quickly become an issue for many satellites. And an example is the Galaxy 15 satellite that I mentioned where a possible electrostatic discharge left operators unable to command the satellite. So it simply drifted aimlessly through geosynchronous orbit for about eight months. And even though they couldn't command it, it was still actively broadcasting. So it interfered with other satellite communications as it drifted by. Um, we also know that during a large space weather event, there's likely to be compounding issues where there are trajectory changes from changes in the neutral density related to space weather. And then to on top of that, there may be anomalies caused by the intensification of the space radiation. So now you're possibly in a situation where you don't know where all the 50,000 satellites are and some of them may not be responding. So, Generally, these satellites in the large constellations are similar design or um, sometimes even identical. So if one has a vulnerability to space radiation, then they likely all do. And frankly, we don't know all the vulnerabilities uh, because space weather has been very mild in the past few years uh, since all these mega constellations have launched. So. The current situation is concerning. So how do we cope with these challenges? Ideally to do that, you would have knowledge of all three of these components that I'm showing here. Um, so you need some understanding of how that, you need a physical understanding of the environment that's captured either in a global model or data or uh, ideally both. Um, you need some understanding of how that radiation impacts satellite systems, and then some way to translate that radiation flux, flux from the model into the engineering effect. And then lastly, you need an application that can bring that all together and provide that information in a simple manner that a satellite operator can understand and act on. So not just some science code, 
sitting off someplace where it can't be accessed. And then ultimately you'd want something like that for all four of the types of radiation. And we're not quite there yet, um, but we're making progress. And today I'm just gonna focus on the two end pieces of this plot. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, the different particle environments, the physics that controls them, and then how we capture that with models and also some of the applications that are available. And there's a whole area of applied science and experimentalists that do things like shoot particle beams at different materials and combinations of materials to understand just how that radiation interacts with satellites. Um, and that piece is by no means complete, but it's outside of my particular area. So maybe that's for a future seminar. Okay, so I'm gonna start by talking about internal charging and the internal charging environment because that's an area where we've made a lot of progress, especially with missions like the Van Allen probes um, that have really helped to solidify a lot of our understanding of the physics that controls these high energy electrons. So typically to pass through minimal amounts of satellite shielding, Electrons need to have energies at least 100 keV. So for the internal charging environment here, we're talking about the high energy electron radiation belts. And this here is just a quick overview of what those look like. So generally they extend from L shells from one out to seven as shown in that top plot here. And I'll just take a minute briefly to explain this because you'll see a lot of plots like this. So first, L shell is approximately the radial distance where an electron would cross the equator. And this is data from the SAMPEX satellite, which is a low altitude polar orbiting satellite. And you can see this simple depiction down here in the bottom left of that orbit on top of the radiation belts. So when SAMPEX is over the polar cap, it's crossing through magnetic field lines that stretch way out to very far distances. Um, so these are very large L shells where there's no electron flux. And then as SAMPEX moves equatorward, it starts cutting through smaller and smaller L shells. And you start to see the high fluxes, usually that peaks around L equals four. There's typically a two belt structure. Sometimes there's more. Uh, SAMPEX gets down to an L shell of a, about one. And then um, you move back outward through that same belt structure. Uh, so this top plot is basically unfolding each of those cuts in and out of the belts. Um, the plot, I just got a something that says it's impossible to read the slides. Yeah, just a quick question there, if it's okay if we interrupt. Um, that one idea was to see if there's a, um, you can deselect the option for optimize for video clip when you do share. So maybe if you could, we could try that in case it helps people see the, the content. If we can give that a whirl. Uh, I don't see that anywhere. Yeah, if you want, maybe so when we stop sharing, you could try stop sharing your screen. And then when you go to share, I think there could be a little button somewhere that says, Optimize for video clip. I'm not entirely sure, but we'll see if that happens. Might make it easier. I think sometimes in the bottom left, it'll say something about sharing sound, but it might have something about the video clip there too. It just, oh, I see. Okay, so optimize for video. It I think if you deselect that it. option. Oh, it won't let you click it? No. Hmm. Okay, I wonder if it's a fixed. Oh, wait, now there. it does it. Let me see. Okay, we can give that a whirl. Um, nope, that's telling me I need to install a Zoom audio device. Hmm, okay. <laughs> Maybe we don't wanna, don't wanna do that option then. Okay. Uh, let me try one there. more time. Is that better? 
I think that's how we had it before. But if the other thing has to do install it, I think maybe we'll just keep going with this well, one. I, okay. So, yeah. I clicked the, the yeah. optimized video, but okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I don't know what I can do. Yeah, it's okay. Thanks for giving it a shot. So. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, so this top plot here, it's 23 years of data. Um, and you can see that there's dramatic increases and decreases in the radiation belt fluxes. This is a log scale, so it's orders of magnitude. Um, and at one point, you can see that the belts almost completely go away. So these changes are caused by this constant comp competition between acceleration and loss processes. Um, so next, we're going to talk just a little bit about what causes that dramatic acceleration and loss. Okay, but in order to do that, we need to briefly talk about electron motion in the magnetosphere. So there's three types of motion. The electrons uh, quickly gyrate about the field line on very short time scales. They're moving at velocities where relativistic corrections become an, important. In addition, they'll move along the field line. So as they get closer to Earth, uh, the magnetic field strength increases and actually forces them back. So they'll bounce back and forth along the field line at time scales of less than a second. And then lastly, due to the radial gradient in the magnetic field, um, they move around the magnetosphere on time scales of minutes. So the full particle motion uh, looks something like this squiggly pink donut in the top plot. So those three types of motion are important when we talk about acceleration because the dominant means for accelerating these electrons and causing those intense flux increases is through interaction with different types of waves at frequencies that match those three types of motion. So acceleration occurs when particles actually move with the wave so that they experience a constant electric field. And this is not breaking new science. Many of you may be familiar with this process, but it is fundamental to what is controlling the radiation belt. So I'm just going to walk through a really brief explanation of how this works. And if you want to know more about the details and lots of the new science being done, I would refer you to Drew Turner's seminar he gave here just a while back because um, he had a lot of good, interesting stuff in that. So one example of, of acceleration due to waves is the interaction with ultra low frequency waves. And I think uh, the next few sessions of these seminars are going to be focused on waves, so that should be good. Um, so the ultra low frequency waves are caused by things like the buffeting of the magnetosphere by the solar wind and Kelvin Helmholtz waves that are generated on the flanks by the solar wind passing by. Uh, the waves have periods of minutes. So they can interact with electrons as they drift around the Earth. This middle figure here uh, is a really simplified picture of how this works. So at time t equals zero, the electron on the left here sees an electric field along its direction of motion that accelerates the electron and also moves it radially inward. Half a period later, that electron has now moved to the opposite side of the Earth. And since the wave is at the same frequency, the electric field has flipped. So again, the particle sees this electric field in the direction of its motion that accelerates it and pushes it inward. Um, but you can imagine uh, an electron that started on the opposite side it would see an electric field that would decelerate it and move it outward. So the ULF waves actually accelerate and decelerate electrons and move them in both directions. This bottom plot here um, is showing a simulation from one of Scott Elkington's papers where he starts with a peak of electrons 
um, at one L shell, he lets it interact with the waves and the waves actually act to spread out that peak of electrons and move them both uh, radially inward and outward. So whether you actually get a net acceleration or a deceleration then depends on the gradient of the electrons as a function of L. So if there's more electrons out at large L, you'll see a net inward motion and you'll get an enhancement. Whereas if there are more at low L, you'll see a net outward motion and a flux depletion. So a similar process works with higher frequency waves such as the VLF chorus. So chorus waves are generated by low energy electrons that are injected by substorms. Those low energy particle distributions are un unstable. They'll perturb the field lines uh, to produce the waves that can then interact with the higher energy electrons. So the low energies end up interacting with the higher energies. And in this case, uh, the electrons will see a constant electric field from the wave, but it's as they gyrate about the field line. And only if their parallel motion along the field is such that they move with the wave. And NASA has this really great little movie showing how this happens, where the top particle catches the wave here. Um, and gets accelerated and the bottom one just keeps going as it was. Um, so in this type of interaction, the particle energy and the pitch angle are changed. And it turns out that electrons that are pushed towards 90 degrees, they will be accelerated um, and vice versa. So again, in this case, whether you actually get a net acceleration, depends on the particle gradients in pitch angle and energy. Okay, and for the losses, I generally talk about two kinds. So one is a decrease in the measured flux that looks like electrons have been lost, but in fact, they've just shifted around to lower energies, different pitch angles and different locations. They do this in response to slow changes in the global topology of the magnetic field. And since they're moving so quickly, most changes are slow. It's only an apparent loss because when the field returns back to its nominal topology, the fluxes, unless something else happens, will also return, which sometimes makes it difficult to quantify what's real loss and real acceleration. And then for true losses, there's only two places that the electrons can actually go. One is at the magnetopause. Um, so that occurs when there's a sudden compression of the magnetopause due to a high speed stream or activity uh, pushing the magnetopause inward. And that uh, loss can be enhanced when there's also outward motion of the electrons due to the interaction with ULF waves. The other place they can go is into the atmosphere. In this case, losses are predominantly caused by interaction with electromagnetic ion, ion cyclotron waves or EMI C waves um, that are produced by energetic ions that are perturbing the magnetic field and creating the waves. And electrons, when they interact with these particular waves, they don't get a big kick in energy but their pitch angle can change so that they actually hit the atmosphere and are absorbed. So how does this all play out? This is what typically happens during a magnetic storm when there is say unusually fast solar wind due to a coronal hole or a high speed stream. So during the main phase, uh, the response of the electrons is really fairly consistent storm to storm. So first you get lower energy particles that are injected earthward through substorms and enhanced convection uh, that will create a ring current, which is measured on the ground as a decrease in the magnetic field strain. So the exact opposite occurs with the higher energy electrons. So those fluxes typically decrease during the main phase of a storm. And it's due to all the loss, loss processes that we just talked about. So 
the electrons move outward in response to that decreasing magnetic field. Some of them will move outward far enough that they hit the magnetopause, um, which is likely uh, compressed and closer in. And then in addition, the outward motion can be enhanced due to that interaction with ULF waves. And then finally, EMIC waves caused by the ring current protons will push the electrons into the loss cone and they'll be lost into the atmosphere. So the activity almost always starts with an abrupt depletion of the belts. And you can see that in this blue uh, arrow here. Here's the start of the storm and the formation of the ring current. And there's an abrupt depletion of the high energy electrons. But then what happens after that as the storm progresses is uh, much more uh, erratic. So often there is a large increase in the flux. And again, that's due to interaction with the waves that we talked about. So ULF wave activity generally continues throughout a storm. Um, but now as the magnetopause relaxes and moves outward, you'll have a source of electrons at large L in the magnetotail. So those waves will push the particles inward and cause a large flux enhancement. And then the VLF chorus power typically increases during a storm because of continued substorm. And those waves then further accelerate the electrons. Um, but that's not always the case. So in this first storm, there's the flux dropout during the beginning, followed by an, an enhancement. There's a second storm here. You see the same flux dropout, um, but then no enhancement. So the evolution is very heavily dependent on one, how the magnetopause is distorted and how far it gets pushed inward. Two, whether you actually have a source of lower energy particles. And three, what kind of wave power is generated that can interact with the electrons? So even though we think we understand a lot of the physics uh, that's going on here, it's still challenging to model what's going to happen because the final outcome depends on knowing a lot of input parameters like wave power that we usually don't measure everywhere. And we certainly don't measure all these things in real time. So nevertheless, of course, we still make an effort uh, to model this whole system. And there's a number of ways you can do that. One is to use test particles and actually follow their trajectories through sophisticated MHD models. Um, the MHD models can do a reasonable job of capturing ULF wave power, but they don't include the higher frequency waves that can cause losses and additional acceleration. They're also computationally very expensive. So Right now we're using these models for science, but not so much for real-time space weather forecasting. Uh, the other type of model that's more commonly used for space weather are diffusion models. So for these models, the interaction with the waves, it's treated as a random process that will randomly kick electrons around and cause particles to diffuse an energy pitch angle and L shell. So it's kind of like a gas slowly diffusing throughout a room. Uh, this process can be described with a Fokker-Planck equation where then diffusion coefficients based on the wave power control how quickly particles move in energy pitch angle and L shell. These diffusion models are simple enough that you can actually run them on a laptop. Um, the difficulty though is accurately describing how those diffusion coefficients and also boundary conditions should change with time and activity. Since we don't usually have real-time measurements of wave power everywhere, often those diffusion coefficients and boundary conditions are parameterized with uh, indices like Kp. But now we're starting to get a little bit more sophisticated and incorporating detailed machine learning models um, to describe things like the wave power and the boundary conditions and how those vary.
And there's a number of different diffusion models that are out there and, and available for space weather applications. One's the verb model. So it's running in real time at two different locations. It's available at UCLA and also GFZ in Germany. The verb model includes data assimilation, which helps to keep the model closer to reality. Since as I've mentioned, there's many inputs and we don't have all those measurements. Another is the CIMI or FOC model. It's running in real time at NASA CCMC, um, but it's sometimes difficult to get data files um, from that model. And then our European colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey have developed a model that's running in real time at ESA. There's also a number of applications for understanding what the impacts actually are. One is the Space Environment Expert System Real Time, or CSERT. Um, this was developed by uh, colleagues at the Aerospace Corporation. It's available now through NOAA SWEEPSI. Um, and what this does, or how this was developed, is hazard quotients were derived that correlate, uh, it draws a correlation between measured fluxes and observed anomalies from past databases. So the hazard quotients will tell you, for example, that you're five times more likely to an experience an, uh, an internal charging anomaly based on the current measurements of the environment. And right now the uh, application at NOAA um, is available for geosynchronous orbit. It has been extended to incorporate other orbits, but it's not publicly available yet. And then there's also the Space Storm Project, um, which has output available through this ESA portal and gives stoplight charts for internal charging at just a couple different fixed satellite orbits. And then at my company, we've developed the Satellite Charging Assessment Tool, or SATCAT. So this is an online web application. It allows users to create a timeline of the internal charging hazard that is specific to their satellite. So users can come into this application, they can choose their satellite, they can specify their shielding on their satellite and then different component materials. And then we take all that information, we can calculate the trajectory, we get the uh, electron flux from the verb model. So it's actually the flux at the satellite orbit. Uh, we pass that flux through the user specified shielding and then calculate the expected internal charging for their chosen specific components. And then you can set that all up to run in real time so you can do routine monitoring. So what's unique about this tool is that it's not just giving a general hazard, it's instead giving a hazard specific to individual satellites, which is important because that hazard can vary a lot depending on your satellite location and design. And we've used this to analyze that Intelsat 29E failure that I mentioned, and we found that a Teflon cable with minimal shielding would have been charged to relatively high levels at the time of the failure, which is consistent with what the company found. So now I've spent more than half the talk just on internal charging and we have two more hazards to go. And again, that's because I think we've made the most progress in that area. And so we have a lot to talk about. Um, but the good news is that the presentation is not going to go on for hours because I only have one slide devoted to surface charging. And it's still a significant issue for satellites, but in my opinion, it's a bit of a, a hole in terms of our space weather modeling. And primarily that's because it's just a more difficult problem. Um, so you, for the lower energy particles that cause surface charging, you can still model their evolution using this same simplified Fokker Planck equation, similar to what you do for higher energies. But now you have to add an extra term that includes the motion of the particles in magnetic local time. 
And the reason for that is because the particle trajectories are significantly affected by electric fields. So we could get away without including that extra term for the higher energies because the electric fields are not significant compared to their energies, but it's not the case at lower energies. There's a lot of ongoing efforts to include this term in the diffusion models that I mentioned earlier. Um, but a major difficulty is that you need to be able to capture substorm injections of low energy particles, which right now is very hard to predict. And you might be able to make up for the substorm physics that's not captured in the models by assimilating data, but we also don't have data with good magnetic local time coverage that's available in real time. So I would say this is one area that needs attention right now. So moving right along, lastly, we're going to talk about single event upsets that are caused by solar energetic particle events. So during an, a solar energetic particle event, very high energy, uh, energy ions stream from the sun, they flood near Earth's space, it can last days to weeks. The high energy ions are, created when the sun releases a fast moving coronal mass ejection. The ions can be accelerated in the shock front ahead of that CME, and then they stream away from the shock towards Earth. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the ions can cause bit flips and other issues for satellites near Earth, but not all regions near Earth are equally affected. Um, so some are actually shielded because the ions get deflected by Earth's magnetic field, as shown in this little schematic in the top right. So if you have a polar orbiting satellite over the polar cap regions, they'll see very high fluxes of ions, but then as they move equatorward, they'll pass into these regions that are shielded. So for a satellite operator monitoring this threat, um, they need to know where their satellite is relative to these access regions, which are not static. Right now, there's a number of different methods to get at this question of where the ions have access. So one way you can do it is using a purely physics-based uh, physics -based approach. Um, so these methods define the access regions actually by tracing particles, uh, ion trajectories outward from uh, different locations and directions in a model magnetic field. And then you know if an ion can make it out of the magnetosphere, then it can also make it in. So you can use this process to find where ions can actually get in. The difficulty with this kind of technique is that it's computationally very expensive, and that makes it hard to use for modeling satellites in particular, um, because you would need to do this kind of tracing at all altitudes. And while it's potentially very accurate, it's also dependent on how accurate your magnetic field model is, and we generally don't really know that very well. Um, you can simplify the process by pre-calculating all these trajectories in some limited number of field configurations. And one of the commonly used SMART and SHEA model um, does this with Siganyenko 89 magnetic field for different conditions. And then it's not quite as accurate, but it at least makes the problem tractable. And then the last method is to define the access regions or where the ion flux cuts off at different energies, just using statistics based on a number of observations. One example of this is the lesky ogliori model, which defines the statistical location or the latitude where the proton flux is observed to drop by 50%. And this is based on a few events uh, that were observed and measured with the SAMPEC satellite. And then this model looks at how that location varies with activity like the DST index. 
Um, so in this case, if you know the measured DSG index, then you can say at what latitude there will be high fluxes and where it will basically drop to zero. Um, the difficulty with this kind of approach is that it applies at this one altitude, um, but it's not clear exactly how we can map these statistical locations out to all satellite orbits. And really the biggest issue is that these current methods don't actually capture the dynamic variation that's observed in individual SEP events. And that's shown here in this top plot. This is work by Paul O'Brien and colleagues. And the plot here, it's showing the measured and modeled cutoff L locations versus time just during one event. Uh, the Lasky model is the statistical model is shown here in pink. And you can see that the models predicting the proton flux will get into about L equals four, and then there'll be that abrupt decrease. And it doesn't really change much throughout the event. The more erratic mess of dots is what's actually measured by the pose satellite. And you can see that they're really quite different. Another issue is that just having a single boundary uh, where you say the flux goes to zero doesn't actually describe how the flux decreases. When the flux is very high, satellites might still have e issues even at locations where the flux has decreased down to 10% of those highest polar cap values. And then really none of these models are easily accessible to satellite operators just trying to figure out what's going on with their satellite. So to address some of these issues, uh, my group has been working right now on developing a new type of model. It's called SPAM and it's not canned meat or annoying emails. Um, it stands for the Solar Particle Access Model. And SPAM is different from the other techniques that I mentioned because we're specifying where the ions have access using real-time observations of those boundaries from the pose met op satellites at low altitude. And currently there are six satellites um, and during an SEP event, one of those satellites will cut through those boundaries uh, uh, just about every 20 minutes or so. So there's no guesswork or statistics regarding where that boundary is. We just measure it. Um, but we do need to figure out then how to map the boundary that's seen at one post satellite at 850 kilometers to all other magnetic local times and altitudes. So to do that, we've compared passes through these boundary regions from a number of different satellites at different MLTs and also at um, altitudes. And we do that comparison by fitting the flux to a Weibull function. So that function that's shown here on the bottom um, captures how the flux actually decreases. So it's not just one sharp abrupt um, drop off. And then it reduces this whole profile down to three parameters. So we can look at how those three parameters vary from one post satellite to another um, at different magnetic local times and how they vary from a satellite at low altitude to a satellite at high altitude. So in the end, we'll, we can take each pass of a post satellite and then map that observed uh, ion flux and that decrease um, to locations throughout the uh, magnetosphere. And this piece is still a work in progress. Once it's completed, we'll integrate that model back into the SATCAD application so that satellite operators can easily get at the expected upset rate for their satellite, um, their orbit, and their specific components. Okay, so I'm gonna end with a question rather than just a straight summary, which I think is fitting to do since the community is getting started now on its next decadal survey, which will define the research priorities for the coming years. So the question to you all is, um, which hazards should be the focus for new observations, research and application development? And we have, 
choice A, internal charging, which has caused significant anomalies in the past. We have some real-time models and applications already developed, and we know it can cause a big expense and issue for geosynchronous satellites. Or choice B, single event effects that have caused fewer anomalies in the past. It is feasible to model. There's not a lot of real-time applications available, but it does happen fairly and frequently. We know it's gonna affect geosynchronous and could possibly have a really big impact on new space and the mega constellations. Or the last choice is surface charging, choice C, which has caused significant anomalies in the past. It's challenging to model. There's not a lot of applications available, and we know it's going to affect both low altitude and geosynchronous orbit. And if you want, you can put your choice in the chat. Maybe we can inspire a white paper for the, the Cato survey, or actually there's one more choice, D, do it all. Um, and I guess I'll stop there and figure out how to answer questions. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, Janet. This is a fantastic presentation, and, and I love the ending on this uh, summary question. You're getting quite a bit of response <laughs> to the vote oh, in the good. chat I there, so we the can uh, flip through those. And actually, as, as people are voting, I'm just going to go back to some of the earlier questions and make sure they don't get buried here. Uh, I believe Richard Denton was the first uh, with the question on some of the earlier slides, and uh, he was wondering, what would an emergency space traffic message mean, uh, and how is that information used to, to prevent problems? Um, that's a good question, and I think it's actually the messages get sent out by the DOD, um, but it's at, up to the companies right now to deal with them as they see fit. So most of them take the parameters and then they try and calculate the likelihood that there will actually be a collision. And one of the issues right now is there's not a good way to communicate between different operators about how they're going to respond. So um, I think it's one of the first times I've actually heard people saying we meet, need more regulation to deal with that kind of thing mm. in a better way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so coming up to the next question here, I believe uh, Jason Durr was wondering, uh, for satellites which have circumpolar orbits, do bursts of the polar wind cause damage comparable to that of, say, the radiation belts? Um, I'd say no, I don't think I've ever heard of polar wind. Um, it's really more the higher energy ions uh, that can cause issues. Polar winds, pretty low energies, pretty low fluxes, and I think it would be unlikely to cause issues, and I don't actually know of any that have seen something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And the next, uh, Dave Pritch, uh, Pitchford has a comment here and also votes for option C, <laughs> surface charging. Uh, but he was just making a comment uh, in the chat people can read just about uh, some of forgotten experience, perhaps in some of the, you know, the benign space weather at a time, which is just reason to be uh, on guard and make sure we don't forget what we've, you know, what we're learning about these things. Um, all right, so yeah, lots of, lots of votes coming in here. I see another question, uh, Naomi. Um, hi, Janet, does your company offer any service regarding uh, surface charging regarding substorm injections? And what would you suggest our community uh, could do to improve this? Um, no, I have not actually tried to do anything with surface charging, partly because I don't think we have very good models. I know um, a couple people have been looking into machine learning model models to try and address that. So I know the Aerospace Corporation, Paul O'Brien has been using Ampere to define different current structures and then use that to understand where you might have um, surface charging. So for our community, um, definitely work on improving modeling. But again, I, you're going to have to have data assimilation to try and capture the substorm injections. I don't really know any good way to do that and mm -hmm. suggestions of course would be very welcome mm -hmm. certainly yep okay so yeah some more votes here scrolling through the chat and i believe uh, lynn's question may have been answered already about uh, deep dielectric discharges which perhaps falls into the internal charging bucket yeah and uh, let's see here so then george also george was wondering uh, have any single event upsets been modeled for actual cosmic ray energies and nucleus or nuclei such as iron um, yes, so there's a 
model called CREAM um, that right now is what people use to try and identify where you might expect to see single event upsets. And I actually did some work with EU MedSAP and MedOp B because they um, had an instrument that would transmit real-time weather information to different countries as the satellite went by and they completely lost one side of that instrument, which they were pretty confident, well, very confident because they could reproduce it in the lab that it was caused by um, a cosmic ray. Um, so I helped them using this cream model to define where to turn on and turn off that instrument so uh, they wouldn't have that same thing happen again. Um, so yes, it has been done. Mm -hmm. Great, very interesting. Okay, well, I think that comes to the end of the questions that, that were there in the chat, although we might have another one. Uh, let's see, Stephen just uh, typed in. So let's see, uh, can quantum field theory, i.e. Uh, the quantum dot concept be used in making novel materials uh, to be used to, uh, that would be immune perhaps to such anomalies? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> yep, it's not my area of expertise, but it would be great yeah, if something that's... like that could, <laughs> could come in, so. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And let's see, uh, Pat was wondering also, can real-time MHD models uh, help guide the predicted impacts? Um, I think they can if you, I mean, there's um, people that are doing test particle tracing and MHD models, but as I mentioned, they don't have the higher frequency waves. So that's an issue. And I know at one point, Anthony Chan and Scott Elkington and others were uh, figuring out ways that you could move test particles um, in MHD fields and then just add this other component to uh, try and capture uh, the VLF wave interactions. But so far, that's not really being done because, again, you need that in real time. And I don't know anyone that's putting out those models in real time that I can access and actually do something with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again, uh, Janet. This is this is excellent, and especially I hope people stay tuned for more on SatCat and the spam uh, model that's being developed as well. I think those will be uh, terrific tools for the for the community going forward. I'll just mention as well for those uh, interested in next week. So we are going to be taking a break for the Gem meeting, uh, and also a couple of weeks in August, taking a break as we prepare for another round of uh, science presentations coming up in mid August uh, with a focus on waves, uh, all all things waves, VLF waves, EMIC waves, like Janet talked about, and, and some others as well. So we hope to see you again back in August. And thanks again to our speaker. Uh, fantastic presentation and great uh, interaction in the chat as well. So thanks for that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a good week.